everybody I'm back again with another chapter so uh, for those of you who are just tuning in I am currently printing off my dad's manuscripts and I am reading them as a way of editing them so I can get them ready to publish because I'm editing his novels and publishing his novels um, and also so that I can get practiced in reading stories aloud and try to put more intonation in them and making them more interesting to read so now you get to go along with me on my process. <laughs> I've already read quite a few stories. It's been a little while now. I I don't, I can't tell, well, I don't know. There might be a pro, uh, might be progress, or may not be progress. I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, so this story, if, if you're interested in, in listening to the beginning of the story, um, I've already, this is the third chapter, so you might want to go back to the beginning in order to get an idea of where I'm at in the story. Or if you're interested in other stories that I've that I've been uh, that I've been narrating, then uh, you'll want to go back to past broadcasts on this channel. So, without further ado, I will present you uh, Chapter Three of A Voice in the Darkness. A funeral could only be held off for so long. It would have been preferable to allow all major Osmans to attend. But the winter meant difficulty in merely getting the word out of the prince's death, let alone t allowing time for Osbans to travel to Plutarch over roads turned into bogs by heavy winter rains. Some of the Osbans, depending on their rank and wealth, had silver lumps of their own, and were so easily notified. Osman Chillard had been gifted with one during the negotiations toward his daughter's betrothal, and also because the prince considered Chillard, in his position on the border, rated improved communications with the principality's capital. Chillard himself had come in. He'd only brought a very small train, since taking wagons over the winter roads was a serious trial. This set rumors running in Plutarch. One was that Chillard was taking his daughter home where she'd be safe from wicked magical things, though a more sensible one suggested he wanted to arrange her betrothal to the new prince. At least he'll wait until after the funeral to bring up the subject. He has that much courtesy. You're going to turn her down, Dolia? The same reasons why your brother made the offer still hold for you, you know. You need an heir, and Chillard holds an important piece of the border. That might be so, Padya, but you'll pardon me if I don't care much for the match. She still hates me, and I haven't seen any reason to like her much. When did liking or not liking have much to do with a, with a marriage among Osbans and princes? Shouldn't you be giving thanks to the divine pair that she doesn't have a face like one of her brother's broodmares? It wasn't as if she could go to her father and say, I think the new prince may have murdered, her, murdered his brother. I hope you aren't going to sell me to him. For one thing, it wouldn't have done any good. No more than her protests would have prevented her betrothal to the late prince. She was almost certain her father was going to try and convince Do Prince Doleg to take on the contract made void by the death of his brother. That was the only thing that could explain his coming all the way down to Plutarch over those execrable winter roads. Nor, nor was it at all likely she could change her father's mind if she had come, if she had some real proof that Doleg had had the light prince killed. The principality had not always passed without ill de deeds and murder being one. Yet, when all was said and done, the Osbans, who united the strongest behind the strongest candidate for prince, were the ones who pros prospered. She'd had one meeting with her father, a cool and distant one. Her first fiancé, having died before she arrived, it was for her father to arrange matters for her, most likely another marriage as soon as possible. She'd been surprised at how much older her father had appeared, still tall and broad, but bowed in the shoulders. Could he have aged so much since summer? Or perhaps it was just the winter roads. He needed more sleep than he'd gotten so far, but she'd never noticed before the, before the beginning bald patch in his reddish hair. Good day, father, she said coolly. He responded by being all lordly and distant. Good day, daughter. Are you being treated well here? Oh, very well. No one is quite sure of my status, and most don't want to offend me for fear I might have revenge on them later which was as broad a hint as she could manage for him to suggest what his plans might be for her future. 
he continued to be lordly and lofty. Ah, yes, don't fret yourself over that, my dear. A woman who's been betrothed to a prince need not fear to make another good marriage. After all, the betrothal was only broken by the death of one of the parties. She wondered if that was, were a hint to her to be careful in her behavior here, at least until another bridegroom could be found. As, she, as if she'd had time to run wild since she'd come here. But of course, but all she said was, Of course, Father. He nodded. Yes, you know it's required, don't you? Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll go find a place to rest. This hasn't been a nice journey, not in the best of circumstances. She'd watched him leave. No, not the best of circumstances. The nearest in line to the late prince was a was a brother the prince had not trusted, from what she'd learned. Did one s throw one support behind that man, or wait a bit to see which way things were going to fall out? And what did that all mean for her? All the older and wiser women had assured her that, save in the most atrocious circumstances, marriage would permit her to have some freedom to do things she wished to do, without the constant necessity of asking her father's permission. The higher she married, the more likely her husband was to be so busy with his own affairs that he would hardly have time to interfere with her life. The word, the word affairs had been said with completely straight faces, making her sure that double meanings were intended. Which made her wonder, what did she want out of life? She had no good answers. Her father wouldn't bring up any new marriage proposals one way or another before the funeral was over. There were some facts that could be counted on, though. The reasons for the marriage between her and Twarda still held for a marriage between her and Doleg. She wondered occasionally if perhaps running off to find that mythical prince in the wilderness might be the best idea. The representative of the worshippers of the third god was a knobby kneed rough-handed carpet weaver. He was a little concerned about being summoned to the presence of the prince, but he controlled it well. Well, our Arakovai, Doleg said, we seem to have a problem. You and your fellow worshippers are not well liked. Unfortunately not, Lord Prince. My concern, Arakovai, is the safety of the principality. It is one thing for, us, for one segment of the population to hate another. Divine pair know there are enough divisions and rivalries between us. It's another thing when these rivalries end in riot and murder. I have people demand I have people demanding that you and your folk be done away with. What do you ha have to say for yourself? Erokovai took a moment to think, and then said, Lord Prince, may I explain to you our belief? I don't know what things you may have heard, though if you've only spoken to our enemies, you may not have heard the truth. Go ahead then. Lord Prince, a hundred years back, down in Great Medologus, a devout prince of the divine pair had a dream. In the dream, it was revealed to him that the divine pair had a son, and that his son should be worshipped along with them. A form of worship was developed, which Though our enemies say it ignores the divine pair in favor of the sun, actually worships all three. This form of worship was approved in various dreams sent by the Holy Three. Despite this, there was a period of many years during which the third god received, a little, accept received little acceptance. However, little by little, the numbers of the worshippers grew, and those who did not accept the ex existence of a third god began to notice us and even object to our presence. <clears throat> Many folk moved up to Lanth Wheel because the Lantha, uh, the Lantha did not care whether two or three gods are worshiped, Doleg said, to help the fellow along. So long as people gave them no trouble for the Lantha worshiped the spirits. I know, and I take no offense, carry on with your story. Ah, oh, yes, Lord Prince. But those who objected to our presence sent people up to warn such inhabitants of Length Wheel as held to the old belief against us. We kept much to ourselves, though our numbers still increased, bit by bit. 
As it happened, when the Lampa came to accept the imperial religion, most of them, and indeed all the higher ones, the Osmans and such, followed after the divine pair, since that was the usage of the emperor and his court. Fortunately, most of them could not be bothered to concern themselves with us, for or against, so there was no move made to outlaw us, as has happened from time to time in the emperor proper, empire proper. On the other hand, the farmers and workmen appeared to have been more easily swayed by the tales of anger of the divine pair, and so our situation has come to be as it is. <clears throat> Save for a few troublemakers, we have tried to give no offense, but we def will defend ourselves against them when attacked, as anyone would. I see. You're certain that your people have never provoked trouble? Save for a few hotheads, Lord Prince, never. We try to discourage it. Those of us who have sense know we're outnumbered, and it wouldn't do to provoke a fight like that. Have I not heard it said that your people hint that those who refuse to believe as you are wrong? Well, some have said such things indeed. It is not the attitude most of our leaders, though. For most part, we are content to see the continual growth of our numbers. Eventually all will believe. I see. And what of those stories of debauchery and lewd behavior in your worship? False, Lord Prince. Our worship ends with a Samori ceremonial meal, including drinking of wine. And while there will always be someone who overindulge, it is frowned on. The lewd behavior is rumor put out by our enemies. It does not exist. Dole considered. He would hardly have expected the man to admit faults in his religion. On the other hand, he seriously, seriously doubted if matters were as terrible as the ad adversaries of the new worship claimed. Very well. I shall continue to investigate. In the meantime, inform your people that provocations against the followers of the divine pair are frowned on and will be dealt with sharply. You may go. Yes, Lord Prince. The late prince was laid out in a coffin, another much smaller coffin beside it, holding the body of his daughter. The prince's coffin was closed as well. No amount of packing and salt could preserve a body for this long. Though I could see the prince shortly after having arrived in Plutarch, his face was unmarked, save for one small cut on his cheek. The prince had seemed old beyond his years. Had the burden of princedom and continually and continual fretting over possible plots against his life age one so? The funeral could no longer be put off. There were a considerable number of Osbans not present, which was unfortunate, though not serious. If it had been summer and the same number had not felt it possible to be present, one could view that as, as suspicious. Doleg looked at the smaller coffin. There had been no question of having it open for, for viewing at any time. Little Singley's condition? Well, Doleg had seen worse in towns destroyed by Nanissa raiders, but it was still not the sort of thing a person liked to look at. Horn Horns wailed and drums beat. The chosen bearers lifted the coffins up and moved off. Doleg and his guards followed closely, with others in order of precedence. They walked through the winding streets to the royal cemetery. As they walked through the streets, people along the route stood by in silent respect for their late prince. Doleg wondered how much of it was respect and how much of it was concerned that someone in an authority noticing their absence and perhaps equating that absence with disloyalty. The music muted as the coffins were, were lowered into the graves and the earth was shoveled in. Stone markers were at hand, carved with the names of the two, Twarda and Singli. For some reason, Doleg felt more sadness over Singli's death than over Twarda's. Yes, he could recall the days when he and his brother were good friends, even close friends, but it had only been after the memories of Uncle Rugba began to plague him that the prince had become suspicious and difficult to live with. But little Singley, she had died without knowing life at all, died from the plotting of someone who, wishing to kill her father, 
not thinking at all of who might be hurt in the process. He sighed deeply and turned to go. Well, Germia, what do we do now? Osbany, other than the suspicion that he may have had his brother killed, the prince is a fairly good man. Not perfect, the divine pair know, but what person is perfect? Look, he's been fair to the third god people, told them not to provoke the rest of us, and ordered that no one incite riots against the third god people. But he's too good friends with that old Borolus. Yes, Osbany, that I don't like either. Who'd know better than that? Who would know better how to call up one of those crunchka things? So far, my father hasn't spoken of the possibility of having me married to Prince Doleg. But given how he arranged the first betrothal before letting me know, that's not much comfort. You know already, Osbany, that the rumors have the two of you as good as wet already. Percha frowned. I think I'd almost be afraid if it were otherwise. It would make me lose all faith in gossip. Apparently, though Osman, Osman's, Hallraft, and Isder were not fully agreed on most things, this was one of the things they did agree on. Lord Prince, Hallraft said, you need to have an heir as soon as possible. That requires you, you to have a consort. All the factors that made Chillard's daughter a wise choice for your brother still hold. He has a border holding, keeping the line of Clem River safe from incursions by Rochevalati. He can also supply good-sized rafts of troops as well as supplies for use in other places. Be straightforward, Osmond Hallraft. Everyone knows that when you say other places, you mean the East. Everyone knows that the East and the Ninnises are a subject dear to my heart. Yes, Lord Prince. Chillard has not spoken yet? No, Lord Prince. We believe he is still waiting for the, an opportune moment. He doesn't want to seem to be coming at you while you're still mourning your brother. I don't like the woman, nor does she care for me, if my report should be correct. Osmond Isder frowned. Liking or not liking has little to do with marriages of state, Lord Prince. Marry her, give her a pair of sons, then do what you like, so long as you don't offend her so badly that Chillard is upset. This is supposed to comfort me, Osmond Isder? If I had a silver imperial for every time someone's told me that lately, I could finance a proper campaign against the Nanessas. Yes, I recognize that a closer tie to Chillard will be for the good of length wheel. Go on, make your representations to Chillard. He will affect to be greatly pleased and surprised at something that he probably expected, and will send the usual polite replies. With luck, we will be a little better prepared to meet the Nanessas in the spring. Yes, Lord Prince. Had a report from an agent in Oldenburg, Clemsmouth, Dolia. There's a story that Ladavan is about to make a try for the prince's seat on behalf of his son. I take this serious because, seriously because the agent that went down went to great lengths to get the message down to us over winter roads. Doleg sighed. Can't say I'm entirely surprised, Kaja. Any details? Just that, Just that word keeps going around up there that for all your close kinship to Torda, the late prince saw fit to make his baby daughter's fiancé his heir rather than you. If the late prince didn't trust you, how can the rest of us? So this means I'm going to have a war in the northwest at the same time as I have a war against the Nanessas in the east? I won't be getting any help from the Empire either, with them at Worth and Gishnapids. It's a God's cursed, rotten day for a demonstration for anything, Borlas. Couldn't it have waited? Actually, Lord Prince, I think it's a very good day for this particular demonstration. You'll make the display that much more striking. Borlas smiled at the gloom and rain. If you say so. Borlas only smiled slightly. I will give the demonstration first, then an explanation. He gave a sing signal to one of the workmen. Ignoring the cool, drizzling rain falling out outside his canvas shelter, the man lit a torch at the end of a long pole. He took this torch into the rain, where it still burnt fiercely for all the wet. He called, Now! 
to more workmen on a wagon which held a, clunk, a bulky wooden tank, as well as what appeared to be a bellows. The men at the bellows began to pump, and a steam of liquid shot forth. The torchman thrust the torch out underneath the stream of liquid, which suddenly became a jet of fire, arcing out into the rain and to fall on a target, a mass of wood and straw. The flame spread across the target, and through, through, and though the target had been thoroughly dampened by the morning's rain, it did not cease burning. What I have done, Lord Prince, is to create an alchemical compound, which, once lit, continues to burn, even in the presence of water. Indeed, it will even burn for a time underwater. It is an ugly weapon, and its range is rather limited, but it can probably be used to good effect. The use of fire may produce a larger morale effect on an army than the number of casualties could warrant. Doleg stood, hand on sword pummel, watching the target gate, target blaze. What goes into this compound? Borlas frowned. Lord Prince, I think it would be best that as few people as possible know that. I will provide you with a written list but it would be best if I did not announce the composition here. After we have used it, people all over will be trying to copy it. Anyone who even knows of one of the components will have a head start. All of your people here are trustworthy, but all it needs is for them to be discussing the matter unaware of someone else behind a wall or outside a window. Best we should make every effort to hold on to our advantage for as long as possible. Dole gave a short nod. Yes, I understand. This will be a great help to us, but if we have a silver, civil war, as well as Nanissa swarming all over us, even this may not be sufficient. However, let my glumness not obscure your work. Air, give each of our workers a small reward from me, in token of a larger one to follow if this power is as effective as it first appears. They demand we lower their taxes? Nonsense! We're fighting the Kishnapis in the southeast. If we remit taxes up in length, we'll, next thing they, we know, they'll be building up their armies and breaking away again. Yes, August Ruler. The Emperor watched as the representatives of the Treasury withdrew. The next matter before him was a report of the army fighting the Kishnapis. After all the appropriate courtesies, the man said, August Ruler, Lord... Belshamta begs you to inform you that the war against the Kishnapids is going well. He says that they are gaining the upper hand, and with one more effort, we may be well victorious. Thank you. Hold yourself ready for a return message when I have considered the matter. He watched as the soldier bowed himself out. One more effort. Was the agreed code to suggest that the emperor himself take the field? Ordinarily, he would have been out there himself from the start, save that his hold on the great Medologus had been somewhat shaky. It was still shaky, the divine pair knew, but most likely he could afford to be away for a season. If one season's absence met the end of Gishnap and threat, he'd better go. It would be almost nice to be able to fight an army who was coming at him with a sword rather than fighting whispers in hidden corners. Borlas was looking older and more worn than Doleg had ever seen him. Are you unwell, Borlas? Unwell? Yes, I believe I am. But no, it's not a matter of any tonic or powder can help. You have a year, Lord Prince. A year? If you have any regard for me at all, don't ask me yet how it's been achieved. But the Nenesses will not attack this summer. Oh, there will not be total peace. You will still have raids and the like. But you have this year to settle matters in the Principality. How? The old man, uh, magician held up a hand. No, don't ask me. I think of the results of the army of an army of Nanissas coming across the border and trying to convince myself that the end may indeed justify the means. No, I will end up telling too much. If I start talking at all. Use your year well, Prince. May I go? 
Doe Leg, still confused, looked at the man's strained face. Yes, you may go. When Borlas had gone, Doleg turned to Padra. What do you make of that, Padya? Never seen the old fellow so upset, Dolia. I think he might have done something even he couldn't stand. Even he? Padja shrugged. You have to admit, that liquid fire stuff is an ugly weapon. Didn't say that. You Sorry, you want to turn it down because it's ugly? Didn't say that. All I said is, it's an ugly weapon. Maybe he's found something even uglier. A curse on the Nanissa race, for instance, that kills a quarter of the men. Don't know as I'd even turn down something like that, Padya. I'd pretty much take anything that'll keep them off of us. Borlas is right. We'll have to settle matters matters here in the Principality. You figure we'll end up, we'll find fire up there with the Ondarg smoke? I'd be a guard's, God's lost fool if I didn't think that way. It would really be nice if I were wrong, but I can't count on it. No further word from up there, then? Come on, Dolia. You know I'd bring it to you first thing. Dolag smiled ruefully. Sorry, this prince business is a bit wearing. Hertz sighed. Well, Germia, it appears that I'm to be a prince's course consort after all. You didn't think anything else, did you, Osbony? No, I suppose not. I just had some sort of kind of hope, though. Osbony, for all you are listening and learning, we have never heard anything to say the prince is any more horrible than any other man. In fact, he seems better than some. The Pranchka that killed his brother? Osbony, ask yourself. If the Pranchka had announced itself as having been sent by, say, the Emperor himself, wouldn't there still be rumors about the late prince's brother being behind it? Kermia, you can say what you want, but I still don't like Prince Doleg. I'll marry him, even have his children, but don't require me to like him as well. Father, don't you think it would be wise to hold, off, hold a marriage off for another year or so? Even for the prince's sake, how would it look for him to be rushing into marriage with his late brother's fiancé. Chillard pursed his lips, which Hertja knew for a sign that he was thinking deeply. At last he nodded. You do have a point there, Hertja. I shall have to put it to the prince's advisors. All things considered, I do have a, have a little bit of influence there, though I wouldn't want to test it too hard. I will try for another year. Thank you, father. Two days later, a messenger brought her a slip of paper bearing her father's rough-schooled handwriting. It's done. They've agreed to the marriage being postponed till a year from this coming spring. It bothered her a little that he hadn't come to give her the news in person. Had the negotiations been that rigorous then? She wasn't sure why the gain of an extra year should be so important to her. The end result was still the same. She'd be married to a man she disliked. The best she could hope for was that her dislike of him might become a little less intense. She knew, too, that he didn't care much for her, either. She'd gone off to a bad start with him out there on the trail, and matters hadn't improved to any degree. In the confined quarters of the prince's palace in winter, it was not possible to avoid the prince, not to mention the fact that the courtesy required them to speak to each other. The morning's incident in the gardens was a fair representation. At this season, there was little or nothing to be seen in the enclosed garden of the prince, but it did provide a chance to be out in the open air, with shelter nearby to rush to in case of rain. She and Germia had gone out into the garden accompanied by two discreet guards. They were all always careful to keep their private discussions of the matters of her spies, as she jokingly called them, brought to her. This meant that their conversations here in the garden were seldom more important than what they would advise the gardeners to put in at what places. There was one wall that was a challenge. First all, off, the wall had been built with a particularly hideous green, gray-green stone, and though, sorry, and through the course of time, some stones had fallen away and had been replaced with something in dark blue. In previous times, they'd already discussed the reasons why those fallen away stones had been replaced with that other color, 
The best notion they could come up with was that the prince of, of that time had been away on a protracted campaign and the work had been undertaken by the gardener's son, who'd been colorblind and drunk as well. Their main discussion these days was what sort of climbing plants could best hide the repulsive thing. A door opened just across from the two men, and there was a sudden sound of men talking at once. <clears throat> as they looked over, two of the prince's guards stepped out and looked around, closely followed by the prince, with his closer friend, Padra and a small crowd of men who seemed to be trying to tell the prince what a fine person he was. The prince held a stoic, fa held a stoic face throughout, but Padra was a little less careful. Much of the time he looked as though he smelt something bad. And then the prince noticed her temony and her maid and held up a hand. A moment, gentlemen. The garden appears to have grown a rose, even in the winter. Hertha snorted though she doubted he heard that. Good, good morning, Osbony. A fine day, isn't it? Two separate trains of thought were running through her mind. One being that well, the prince could be really nice if he tried. The other being that she disliked the thought of being used as a means of diverting the courtier's blather. Then one man, in the, young man in the back said, how fortunate is the prince to have such a lovely rose in the garden. Hercha never much liked flattery, ever since she found out that no one, save perhaps Germia, would give an answer to Chillard's daughter without at least some thought for what was best. She looked at the man, a look that clearly told him he had mistaken the situation. My maid and I were in the midst of discussing what sort of plants would be best to hide some of the ugly features of the garden. Unfortunately, you move around too much for that sort of thing, don't you? She was immediately ashamed of herself, of course. The man didn't an dare answer back, since he was trying to make an impression on the prince, and a slanging match with the consort-to-be would not prove, it would not improve his cause at all. Which train of thought drove her back to the prince himself, who seemed to show a slight, a little light of interest, even a smile at a set-down he'd probably loved to have given the fellow himself. Save that politics required one smile at a person one would rather thump on the head. Thank you for your use of the garden, Lord Prince. I think my maid and I had best go inside. The weather seems to have turned out a bit chilly. Oh, if you didn't need to go away on our account, Osbony, I'm sure we can keep our conversation low enough as not to disturb you. She shook her head. I think best not, Lord Prince. Uh, good day. She hustled away with Germia behind her. She wondered if that man was always going to have that effect on her. The only salvation was that the thought in her mind of herself refusing to talk to the prince on the day when they exchanged their vows, causing altogether too much consternation among the gathered nobles, was silly enough to make her smile. Not quite enough to go back and apologize to the prince in public, though. If there were anything good to be said for the whole situation, it was that the prince did not attempt to force his presence on her. It seemed that the marriage meant to him only a secure northern border. But to be honest, had it meant anything more to Twarda? Then, almost suddenly, it was spring. The imperial agent, Oring Fa, asked for a meeting with the prince. Him being the emperor's presence in the principality, this was an equivalent of a demand that the emperor see him. For a very long time, the imperial agent's quarters had been in the midst of the imperial barracks. One agent had grown tired of the comparatively rude structure, rude, crude quarters available in the midst of the army barracks, and had purchased a building in the city of Plutarch, which he proceeded to turn into a mansion. It was to this mansion that Doleg and Padra went one spring morning. The agent was courteous, offering them a cup of wine, return courtesy required that they accept. So they sat politely chatting about the spring weather and the prospects for the, the coming year's crops while Doleg held his impatience in check. He was fairly sure that the news was bad, which meant a lot of plans had to be made and remade, but a prince didn't demand that the imperial agent get to the point. Finally, Oring Fa did get to the point. 
Lord Prince, a message has come from the Emperor regarding your request for the amelioration of taxes. The request has been refused. I see. Thank you for your efforts on our behalf, Lord Agent. Though I wonder whether those efforts consist of anything more than sending along the request, even with any recommendation that it be accepted. He thought to himself. The cumbersome progress of leave-taking from the Imperial agent required Dole to maintain a strong hold on his temper for some time more until they got out onto the street and some distance from the Imperial agent's quarters. Even then, it was Padra who bro broke the silence. So, Dolia, now we have the sure word. What do we do? Stamp our feet and swear? Possibly. But I think it's something is a bit more call is called for. What force does the Imperial agent have at his command? We've been through that before. I don't think the figures have changed. About 600 men. But those are Imperial troops. Imperial troops who've been sitting on garrison duty for years and haven't seen a fight in a long time. I think, Padja, it may well be time to tell the Emperor that we have ceased paying his taxes. He's busy with, with the kitchen up that's down in the east, southeast. By the time he deals with that, we can figure out what to do next. There's a lot of people up here who still remember the stories of the warrior Emperor, Dolia. August ruler Teva True is no em warrior Emperor. I think it's time we stopped acting as if a twitch of the Imperial toe could overthrow us. Our main trouble up here is Gulani and his Denises. Gushnapas are no threat in the north. Think of this, too. Why are we taxed so heavily? To keep us from building up a up too large an army? Yes, because the Emperor fears an armed principality of Languil. An easy way to keep us under the Imperial thumb is by taxing us to the point where we can barely defend our own borders. Just as every third person here fears the return of the warrior Emperor, so the Emperor feel, fears length wheel armed. You think so, Dolia? I think so. Now I have to convince you and all the rest. There's a sharp rap on the door, and a guard stuck his head in. Boy with a message, Lord Prince. Send him in. A dark-haired boy stepped in. Who, a boy whose almond-shaped eyes suggested more than a touch of Nanissa ancestry. Lord Prince, Commander Ihark, wishes to speak to you on the silver lump. He says it's urgent, Lord Prince. Dolag stood, looking at Padra. Nanissa's over the river already? Padra shrugs. Seems a little bit early to me, but the bandy little beggar bastards don't necessarily follow a civilized schedule. The magician, who was presently manning the silver lump, was the one, was one Dolag didn't know yet. An older man, long-faced with a beak of a nose. Good day, Lord Prince. Commander Ihark wishes to speak to you. As if the boy hadn't passed much that much of the message along. Well, here I am. The fellow said a word, and Ihark's, Ihark's broad, flat face showed above the silver lump. He spoke without pre preliminaries. Lord Prince, we've been getting disturbing word from across the frontier. It appears that a plague of some sort has hit them. Cholera, from the descriptions we've heard. Traders who come up from and go from the disputed territory say that it's been tearing through the Nanissa camps. Doleg frowned. You've closed the frontier? Yes, Lord Prince, to the best of my ability. There are always places where a determined man or two can sneak across but we've got most of it covered. Good. Set up camps. Anyone crossing the river has to spend four weeks in one of our one of the camps before they can go anywhere else. Enforce it by execution if necessary. Yes, Lord Prince. The Prince signaled the magician to turn off the silver lump, then turned to Padra. If there's a plague in the Nanissa country, we may get it too. On the other hand, it may slow down our attack. Give us time to knock the principality into shape? Could be. I'm wondering about this opportune plague, though. Okay, so that's the end of this one. As you can see, I really, really 
yeah, this is one of the better ones. It's got a lot of intrigue in it. Um, when I work with it, I'm going to be building on that a bit more because there's just, there's so much more to it that I can kind of seed in. So I'm really, really excited about this story. Um, yeah. And without further ado, I'm going to talk to you guys all again next week with another chapter in this story. All right. Have a, have a good night.